Okay, and as I said, we are celebrating uh, NASA's 60th anniversary as well as starting the run-up to the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And we are um, remarkably fortunate to have uh, six former NASA administrators, and they will be introduced uh, more in just a minute, but let me just quickly run down through that. The eighth NASA administrator, Richard Truly. Number nine, Dan Golden, who also holds the record of being the longest serving NASA administrator. Number 10, Sean O'Keefe. Number 11, Mike Griffin. Number 12, Charlie Bolden, who is the second longest serving uh, administrator. And number 13, James Frederick Bridenstine. And Jim is going to make the, uh, the opening keynote address, and I'd like him to, to come up here. Jim is an Eagle Scout. He has, uh, uh, he's from Rice University, where he triple majored, earned his MBA from Cornell. He's a naval aviator, retired with the rank of lieutenant commander. He was elected to the House in 2012, uh, the Oklahoma first. I think that's a great... That's a, that's a great tail number right there. OK1 is, uh, is, has got to be a great, uh, a great tail number. He represented Tulsa. And on April 23rd, 2018, he was sworn in as the 13th administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's a huge honor to have you with us, and welcome. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that nice introduction. And it is um, a real honor to be here with such an esteemed group of former NASA administrators. I'll, I'll share a quick story. And I, I know Charlie and I have talked about this before in public. Um, but the first time I had the opportunity as the nominee to sit down with, at the time, the, um, the immediate past uh, NASA administrator, Charlie Bolden, um, I, got, I got to sit down at a table with him. The first thing he says to me is, look, here's how it works. <laughs> Everything that happens on your watch that somebody before you uh, put into place, you take credit for it. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget that. And certainly uh, that's been uh, the, the history and the legacy of this agency. And of course, um, I will be really clear any success that I have as the NASA administrator is due to a whole lot of very hard work that came long before my time. And I stand on the shoulders of giants, and today we're going to see that on this panel. So it's a, it's a real honor to be here today. October 5th, 1957. You know, we think about this is the 60th anniversary that we're celebrating of NASA. So let's go back 61 years, two weeks. From Friday, 61 years ago, was the launch of Sputnik. And for a little while, Americans looked at it and said, wow, that's really cool. Here we have a nation on Earth that just launched an artificial moon. You know, it's only the size of maybe a little bit bigger than a basketball. It weighs 180 pounds. It sends out blips in the electromagnetic spectrum. Anybody with a shortwave radio can listen to Sputnik as it flies overhead. And, and certainly, if you have good eyesight, you can look up at the night sky at certain times and actually see it with your own eyes. It was launched on a Saturday. And the following Tuesday, the Soviets detonated the largest H-bomb in human history at that point. And all of a sudden, the United States of America and our leadership got very nervous. And they said, if they can launch a satellite into orbit, they can hit any point on the planet with a nuclear weapon. Less than a month later, the Soviets launched Leica. Leica was the Soviet space dog. Leica means, in Russian, it means barker. Or at least that's what Wikipedia told me. <laughs> and I guarantee you, Leica barked a lot with a very thick Russian accent because Leica was not intended to ever come home. Leica was an experiment. This little dog that was taken from the streets of Moscow was an experiment to see if is, is it even possible for a living being to survive in a, in a zero gravity environment. At the time, nobody, nobody even knew that, let alone how long could Leica live. Well, 
Laika lived for about four hours, had the opportunity to orbit the Earth a number of times, uh, and of course struck fear uh, again into the hearts of Americans. Then in December of 1957, just a couple of months later, a couple of months after Sputnik, a month after Laika, the United States of America launched its own rocket called Vanguard, and the intent was to really respond to what we just saw the Soviet Union do. And in that launch, uh, the rocket cleared the launch pad and then it fell back to Earth with a massive explosion. The media, as it does, decided to call the launch not Sputnik, but Kaputnik, or Stayputnik, or Flopnik. On January 14, 1958, Hugh Dryden, who was at the time in charge of the NACA, the National Advisory Committee on Aeronautics, he put together a report for the Eisenhower administration. And in this report, he says this, it is of great urgency and importance to our country, both from the consideration of our prestige as a nation, as well as military necessity, that this challenge, when he says this challenge, he's talking about Sputnik, be met by an energetic program of research and development for the conquest of space. It is accordingly proposed that the scientific research be the responsibility of a national civil agency. NACA is capable, by rapid extension and expansion of its effort, of providing leadership in space technology. That was Hugh Dryden. At the time, he was the head of the NACA, and he eventually became the first deputy administrator of NASA. He was making a recommendation to the Eisenhower administration. Then on January 31st, 1958, Another month passes, the United States of America has a successful launch of Explorer 1. And all of a sudden, people start believing that the United States can compete in space with the Soviet Union. President Eisenhower used that opportunity to do a joint session of Congress. This is an important point. A joint session of Congress asking that we start a civilian agency responsible for aeronautics and space research. 1958, during the course of that year, Congress passes, the President signs, and October 1st, 1958, NASA is established. And so a few short weeks from now, we will celebrate 60 years of NASA. Two and a half years after NASA is created, the Soviets launch Yuri Gagarin. And they just didn't launch him into space, they launched him into orbit. Once again, the United States of America realizes that we're behind. Days after Yuri Gagarin's launch, the United States has a group of Cuban exiles trained by the CIA invade Cuba in a terrible disaster called the Bay of Pigs, which is an embarrassment for our new president at the time, John F. Kennedy. So here you have a president of the United States, John F. Kennedy, who ran for president saying, that President Eisenhower was not tough enough on the Soviets, that he was falling behind, that we needed to move faster, we needed to do more. He becomes president. The Russians launch Yuri Gagarin into orbit. We still haven't launched a man into space, let alone into orbit. Then the Bay of Pigs failure occurs, and John F. Kennedy is looking for a response. John F. Kennedy uh, turns to his, vice, to his vice president, Lyndon Johnson, and he says, we have to do something big, and we have to have something sufficiently visionary that ultimately, when this event occurs, the entire world will look at the United States and know that we're ahead. But it has to be sufficiently distant into the future that nobody can say we're behind right now today. And Lyndon Johnson went to work to find out what that might be. It wasn't too much longer after Yuri Gagarin launched. Three weeks later, Alan Shepard was the first American into space. To be clear, he did not orbit. He went straight up and he went straight down. But John F. Kennedy decided to use that as an opportunity. Remember, Alan Shepard passed the Kármán line. He went into space, did not orbit the Earth. John F. Kennedy goes to Congress. And he gives a speech, and again, a joint session of Congress. This is important. 
We saw this with, with Eisenhower in 1958. Now we're seeing it with John F. Kennedy in 1961. These are gentlemen that are presidents of the United States going to Congress in a joint session advocating for something significant in space. And what John F. Kennedy says, in order to get all the members of Congress to, to show up, he says, I'm going to give a speech on urgent national needs. That's what John F. Kennedy says. May 25th, 1961, John F. Kennedy gives a speech, and in it he says, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. Imagine a president of the United States going before a joint session of Congress saying that we need to send a man to the moon and return him safely to the earth and, and, and bragging in that joint session of Congress, bra bragging that no mission we could undertake will be so difficult or so expensive. We're going to do this because it's the most difficult thing we can do and it's the most expensive thing we can do and because of that, we're doing it, not them. That was John F. Kennedy's message to a joint session of Congress. And so began not just NASA, but our journey to the moon. Obviously, we're familiar with Mercury, Gemini, and then Apollo. A few minutes ago, John Langford was talking about, you know, if we were to compare it to today with EM1 and EM2 and how are we going to get to the moon, if we were, if we were to go back and look at it, Let's start with the Apollo program, Apollo 1. We all know the, the result of Apollo 1. A disaster, a failure. Three brave American astronauts died during a test. And of course, Congress was thrown into disarray and said, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. We're going too fast. Why are we doing this? What is the end result? Lyndon Johnson, of course, had a charge to keep. We had to get a man to the moon by the end of the decade, and he intended to keep it. So with, with not only him, but also a NASA administrator at the time, James Webb, they used every tool in their tool belt to make sure Congress stayed forth, kept going forward to getting a person to the moon. And in fact, after Apollo 1, they decided to skip Apollo 2 and Apollo 3, and they went straight to Apollo 4. Apollo 4 was the first time that we tested the Saturn rocket, the largest rocket ever to launch in human history. So we tested the Saturn V rocket on Apollo 4, and it was a success. It was uncrewed. Then on Apollo 5, it was a, an Earth orbit test of a, of a lunar lander. And it was successful, but it was not on a Saturn rocket. That was Apollo 5. And Apollo 6, they tested the Saturn rocket again. This time, again, it was uncrewed. It was perfectly safe but it was a failure. The Apollo 6 on launch, the first stage, started to pogo. Massive vibrations. Parts of the rocket were falling off. Stage two of the Saturn V, two of the five engines didn't even light. And of course, the upper stage put forth enough energy to get it into orbit, but not enough energy to test in it, and of course, the the command module came back, and when it re-entered, it, it, it was all good. The problem was it wasn't going anywhere near fast enough to test the heat shield that it was designed to test to re-enter the atmosphere. And even worse, that engine that's supposed to fire up for a translunar in injection to get us to the moon, that particular engine didn't even light. That was Apollo 6. Total failure. Apollo 4 was a success. Apollo 5 really didn't test the Saturn at all. Apollo 6 was a failure by every stretch of the imagination. Of course, it was safe, so you got to give them, you know, credit for that. And in that environment in August 1968, NASA made a decision. Apollo 6 was a failure. We have not launched Apollo 7 yet. But Apollo 8, in December, is going to the moon. That was not on the agenda. But something significant happened. After the failure of Apollo 6, 
the Russians announced that they were going to, and they had already been launching things around the moon. At first it was an uncrewed spacecraft, then it was a, a spacecraft that was occupied by turtles and fruit flies. And so the United States of America said, we've got to do something big and we've got to do it fast. The lunar lander was having problems. It wasn't being developed fast enough. How are we going to get to the moon before the end of the decade? And they said, well, we're going to take Apollo 8. We're going to put humans on board. Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, Bill Anders. We're going to put them on board. And having had only one successful test of Saturn and one failed test of Saturn, we're going to make a plan to send them to the moon, knowing full well that the rocket necessary for the translunar injection in its last test failed. And guess what? If it fails on the way to the moon and on the way home, a couple of things can happen. Those astronauts can be sent off into a trajectory that puts them in orbit around the sun for however long the, that they can stay alive in that capsule. They could actually be sent right into the moon, or they could end up, if they go into that low lunar orbit, they could end up in that low lunar orbit for the rest of their lives, which in this case would have been about four days. NASA made that very difficult decision based on the circumstances on the ground. Friends, that mission was done as a response to world events. And it was the most dangerous mission probably that NASA ever undertook, Apollo 8, to orbit the moon. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just a, a free return trajectory, no kidding. They you know, retro-boosted in order to get into a low lunar orbit, and then they orbited the Earth, or orbited the moon, took a lot of images, um, did a lot of um, science. Ultimately, they, they powered themselves out of lunar orbit. And what's amazing is all of this was done when we think about the, the time when they were orbiting the moon, it was done on Christmas Eve. So not only was the risk that, you know, people would never think of the moon again the same way if this ended up not working, which is absolutely true, but it's also true that if it didn't work, it would wreck Christmas, not just for all of America, but for all of the world. And on Christmas Eve, when this crew of three brave astronauts started communicating about what they saw at the moon, one out of every four people on Earth listened to that broadcast. One out of every four people on Earth listened to that broadcast. And a lot of people, maybe some people in this room, remember they, where they were on that Christmas Eve. From there, we went not just Apollo 8, Apollo 9, Apollo 10, Apollo 11, we landed on the surface of the moon. And as the NASA administrator, I walk around NASA, I talk to people about why they work at NASA. Anybody who was around at that time is very clear. They remember exactly where they were during Apollo 11 when Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, who's here today, landed on the surface of the moon. They know exactly where they were, and it inspired them to change the course of their lives and enter the field of space. And that's very common around NASA. 1972, the last Apollo mission leaves the moon. Gene Cernan was that last person that had his foot on the moon. And then three years later, this is the most important thing you're going to hear today, three years later, your current NASA administrator was born. I'm glad you were listening. <laughs> Think about that. I wasn't alive. And friends, there are people 10 years older than me that either weren't born yet or were too young to remember that particular event. It's time we go back to the moon, friends. And I want to be clear, we've had great visions in the past. Yes. We have had great visions in the past. The Space Exploration Initiative, George Herbert Walker Bush. The Vision for Space Exploration, George W. Bush. We've had amazing visions in the past. The challenge has always been, 
we either get distracted, budgets don't materialize, world events happen, and we end up missing the mark. And I want to be clear, no fault of any of the amazing people that came before me at all. In fact, they did their utmost and their absolute best. But the president recently signed Space Policy Directive 1. And in that Space Policy Directive, he says we're going to the moon. You know, I say we're going back to the moon. I don't like using the word that we're going back to the moon. We're not. We're going forward to the moon. We're doing it in a way that's never been done before. And Space Policy Directive 1 is absolutely clear on that. A number of things are different today than it was in the 1980s or the 1990s when these great visions were had. The biggest change is that now we have a very robust commercial space enterprise that can help us get there. We also have more international partners than at any point in the history of space exploration. And there are more countries every day getting space agencies that we can tap into. So we're going to return to the moon, the key word being sustainably. People say, well, this country's going to the moon, and that country's going to the moon, and they're going to beat us. Here's the thing. There's only one country on the planet that is going to build an architecture for sustainability so we can get back and forth to the moon over and over and over again. And the way we can do that is simple. We've seen what happens with reusable rockets. The cost goes down, access goes up, and by the way, those reusable rockets provided by a lot of our commercial providers are, are not just in existence by accident. They're in existence because of the people who came before me that worked so hard on commercial resupply and commercial crew. But now we know what happens with reusability. Cost goes down, access goes up. We need every part of the architecture between Earth and the moon to be reusable. We need the launchers to be reusable. We need the tugs that go from Earth orbit to lunar orbit to be reusable. We need the gateway that ultimately is a reusable command module that will be in orbit around the moon for 15 years. And we need landers that can work with the gateway, that can go back and forth to the surface of the moon over and over again. Reusability is ultimately what will enable us to have a sustainable architecture. And I've heard people say, well, you know, that doesn't include SLS and Orion. No, it does. EM4, the plan is Orion to start having reusable components. And by the way, even on EM1, we're reusing the avionics on Orion. And when it comes to SLS, the, the throw weight and the fairing size enables us to get more capacity to the moon than ever before in human history. So this enables us to build the architecture that allows reusability. It is all a critical part of the architecture to get us permanence at and around the moon. Now, we're, we're not planning to have a permanent presence of humans on the moon, although I'm not opposed to it. If we can make that happen, I'm all for it. But robots, landers, rovers, and humans, when necessary and appropriate, will all have access to the surface of the moon over and over again. The idea being behind this architecture that we're going to retire risk. Take all of the technology, all of the human physiology. We now know what, ha know, we know what happens when humans are in orbit for six months, even up to a year. The, the deconditioning of, of the cardiovascular system, the, the, challenge with the challenges with the neurovestibular system, the, the bone loss, um, the, the immune system de degrading, all of these things happen in a microgravity environment. The question is, can you do that for six months to nine months and then end up on the surface of another world and be perfect? Because you're going to have to be perfect. Why am I saying this? The moon, friends, is a proving ground for all of the capabilities and technologies that we want to be able to replicate perfectly at Mars. Now, it won't be perfect. There's differences between the moon and, the Mar and Mars, and we all recognize that. But the idea behind the moon is that we have a perfect opportunity to retire risk, prove the technology, prove the physiology, and then ultimately accelerate our path to Mars. So we're going to have reusability. We're going to take advantage of commercial partners. We're going to take advantage of international partners. We're going to retire risk, and then we're going to take that entire architecture to Mars. Let me tell you some other reasons why we need to go to the moon. 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed on the moon. From 1969 up until 2008, 39 years, we believed that the moon was bone dry. 
How did we miss the fact that there's hundreds of billions of tons of water ice on the surface of the moon? Well, we missed it because we went to that equatorial region. We went six times, and each time it was in that same general equatorial region of the moon. We need to get more access to more parts of the moon than ever before with this reusable architecture. That's why the gateway is important. It's not only a reusable command module, but it's going to have solar electric propulsion that not only keeps it in that near rectilinear halo orbit, but it can go to the L1 point, and it can go to the L2 point, and it can give us more access to more parts of the moon than ever before. And because it's in that near rectilinear halo orbit, it doesn't have to deal with the harsh thermal effects of orbiting the moon in low Earth orbit. That gives us sustainability for the long term. But the idea is this, we need more access to more parts of the moon than ever before so we don't miss for the next 39 years what may be on the moon that we didn't know of before. And of course, in this room, everybody knows what that water ice represents. It represents life support. Water to drink, air to breathe, but it also represents rocket fuel, hydrogen and oxygen. And of course, the idea, if we could ultimately put that into cryogenic form and put it into orbit around the moon, that gives us access to more parts of the solar system than potentially ever before. And that's not necessarily true. We need other technologies. Nuclear electric, for example, and nuclear thermal. These are all technologies that we need to develop if we're going to go further in the solar system than we've ever gone with humans. And we intend to, and we're working on it every day at NASA. So know this, you know, we think back to the history of NASA and we think about its importance in, in all of our lives, the history of our country. And a lot of us were not even born when all of that took place. And the visions that have come since then have not always materialized. But because those visions existed, we at this point in history have more opportunity to do more than ever before. And we're going to take advantage of that by going to the moon, retiring the risk, and going on to Mars. So I just want to say what an honor it is to be here. I'm looking forward to this amazing panel of such esteemed people. And, uh, and thank you so much for having me. God bless. Please welcome to the stage, the panel, and our moderator, Roger Lanius. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Roger Lanius. I'm a historian. Uh, for part of that time, I served as a NASA chief historian, but I've also been to the National Air and Space Museum where I was a curator and ultimately associate director. That had better be your favorite museum in the world. Be that as it may, I would like to welcome this panel to the stage. We have an august group. There is no question about that. This is the greatest collection of NASA leadership in one location that has ever been assembled. It represents the last 30 years of the space agency's leadership and is a remarkable uh, achievement in so many ways. Uh, they've already been introduced, but let me point them out to you in case you don't know their faces. On the far right, I'm sorry, your left, uh, is, uh, is Vice Admiral Richard Truly, who served as an NASA administrator in the late 1980s and early 1990s, responsible for a whole series of things, including piloting space shuttles at one point, but also recovering from the Challenger accident and bringing the agency forward <coughs> to a return to flight. Um, next to him is Dan Golden. Oh, I'm sorry, yes, Dan Golden, who uh, served as you've already heard, the longest term as a NASA administrator between 1992 and uh, the early 2000s. Next to him, Sean O'Keefe, who came in thereafter and served uh, in the first part of the Bush administration. Then Mike Griffin, uh, NASA administrator between 2005 and 2009. Beyond that, of course, Charlie Bolden, who served just recently and then 
was succeeded by Jim Bridenstein, whom you've already heard from. This is an august group. They have piloted the agency for the last 30 years. And we are at the point now where uh, it's appropriate to reflect on that history of the agency. You heard some of it already from Jim Bridenstine's talk. But beyond that, the reflections of each of these individuals will help bring a personal message to what is taking place and what has taken place in the agency. I have a series of questions that I'd like to, uh, to begin with, but there's also questions from the audience which I will get to shortly. So initially, I'd like to begin by just asking each of you, and we can just go down the list um, of people, what issue was the most pressing when you came to NASA, and how did you deal with it? Can we start with Dick Truly? <laughs> wow. Well, first of all, um, let me uh, thank AIAA and NASA for inviting this group. This is an important uh, uh, opportunity to look back at a history of a great agency. As far as uh, <coughs> I'm concerned, it's been a long time, but I remember it well. My tour, at, first of all, I, I had flown Enterprise, Columbia, and Challenger, and then left NASA. And uh, my tour as administrator uh, really was a blur between the time I came back to NASA after the uh, Challenger accident. Everybody remembers the Challenger accident, but what people don't uh, remember so much is that in about a six month period of time, uh, the nation lost the Challenger, two Titan 34Ds, an Atlas, and a Delta. And we were in the middle of a Cold War and our entire launch fleet was down. So uh, we finally uh, uh, recovered the Challenger and the other vehicles, but the really nas national challenge was the fact that we had DOD payloads and NASA big payloads like Magellan and Galileo and Hubble as far as the eye can see on the manifest. And uh, so that was number one, to uh, build uh, the tracking data and relay satellite constellation and then deliver safely and reliably uh, those payloads to orbit. Uh, secondly, uh, Space Station Freedom at the time had been started by President Reagan, and uh, it was in trouble, budget trouble, schedule trouble, uh, congressional political trouble. And then, an opportunity uh, about two or three weeks uh, after I became administrator was the 20th anniversary of Apollo 11. And I'm sure Buzz remembers this well. Uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush on the mall with the Apollo 11 crew on the stage, made a speech that said that we were gonna fly space station, we were gonna return to the moon, this time to stay, and then to Mars. That was on top of 
the manifest, and the station. Other than that, there were a whole lot of problems. Uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Golden, same question. What were your key issues when you came in? How would you deal with them? There are a few, but before I do that, I'd just like to talk about a little of my background. Uh, Jim Bridenstine talked about when he came into the world. Yeah. I came into NASA in 1962. I came into NASA in 1962 to work on nuclear-propelled electric systems that were going to take us to Mars in 79. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Um, I love NASA. I remember being in Physics 101 in 1957 when my physics professor, Donald Cotton, wrote on the board, Sputnik is watching you. He found out about it, not from CNN, but listening to the radio while eating lunch. It changed my life, and at that point, I knew I was going to spend my life with NASA and did so from 1962 until November of 2001. It was wonderful. The issue that I faced was some of the things that uh, Dick talked about. But there was another element. The world was changing, and NASA was formed to show the world our superiority over the East, over Russia. Russia crashed after the Cold War, and President Bush, 41, had the wisdom to understand that if we didn't help Russia, they'd be selling missiles to Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. We all know those three names, and they're still very much in the news. So instead of living in a bipolar world, it was now a multipolar world. And my job was to bring in the Russians. And for me, it was hard, because after I left NASA in 1967, I spent 25 years of my life in national security building systems to help win the Cold War. And within two months of the time I was at NASA, I was sitting across the table in Blair House from Boris Yeltsin, wanting to go into the SS-18 factory in Nepopetrovsk to understand what was going on. Hypothetically, maybe I was targeting that place, but who knows. Um, <laughs> but the world changed, and we had it change with it. And then the second problem I faced, I'm going for two, not one. Fine. The technical revolution of the internet and semiconductors and a new generation of engineers was sweeping over and NASA couldn't, uh, couldn't ignore it. And the implication of the internet and the semiconductor revolution said, we now no longer had to build big things that would take decades and cost billions but we could dock in the skies with small spacecraft. It's taken a while to get there, but as I read what's happening in the commercial industry, my heart feels good. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Mr. O'Keefe, how about you? Well, as a child of the Apollo era, I mean, I, I was not of the same uh, contributory Say, standard. You're not, a, you're not as old as me. <laughs> <laughs> as Dan Golden. But uh, to be sure, my memory of that period as a, uh, as a youngster and then ultimately as a teenager seeing that develop, uh, the excitement of my generation, of course, was a palatable motivation to be involved in NASA. And so when the opportunity presented itself, in the first year of the Bush 43 administration, when I was in the capacity as the deputy director at OMB, I found that the issue that was most compelling wasn't the motivation of Apollo era, it was how to ever complete the International Space Station. Uh, the challenges were, were continuous, an awful lot of work had been put into the effort in the previous administration to develop it, move it through, 
but coordinating, as Dan just said, a, an effort of multi-nation cooperation was something that had never been tackled to the size and scope of what the International Space Station had required. And awful lot of diligence, awful lot of effort, a decade of, of time, really at that stage, by the, the time it had emerged as an International Space Station during the era that Dan talked about, it still nonetheless required an awful lot of collaboration that was a, a very delicate kind of set of inter, interrelationships. That was the pressing issue, how to complete this, how to continue through a, a program of that cooperation that Dan described that was so imperative in the post-Cold War era, and yet it, at the same time inclusive of so many other nation states. It became a platform, NASA did, for the purpose of establishing those international relationships, maintaining the depth of the foreign policy of the time in order to keep the, uh, the strength of our own national foreign policy very much um, uh, a, a, co a cooperative and collaborative effort as opposed to uh, directive in nature. Uh, and it was in that new world order that he described, I think so aptly, that was totally undefined and one that really required a lot of effort. Well, this was a large-scale systems integration challenge of trying to pull together something that had never been accomplished before and was still not yet complete, was still in the phase of, of, uh, of uh, completion at that stage and collaboration with the Russians, the Canadians, the Japanese, the Europeans, in order to assure that we would have a sustained capacity over an extended period of time uh, to maintain that collaborative capability, to, to look for the technology and science breakthroughs, to achieve the kind of insight that uh, Jim Bridenstine, I think, spoke to so eloquently of what are the motivations and what are the opportunities now to build on uh, to maintain a capability as a permanent presence in space uh, and starting as a, a platform on the moon and so forth, that this was a major, major endeavor in order to do that, and the objective, first and foremost, was to complete the task. Um, that was a, a, a difficult challenge by virtue of just the issues of, not only the systems engineering issues and the technology development questions, as well as the, the financial requirements of collaboration and cooperation among all those different global partners. But it was uh, compounded by the fact that the only means, really, reliably, uh, to get there with the full component capability of what was aboard the International Space Station was on the space shuttle itself. Uh, certainly the resupply missions through the so Soyuz program that the Russians had provided for crew exchange as well as you know, consumable resupply largely through the progress vehicles was the only other ancillary means to accomplish that task. Within one year, after pursuing this mission to begin to really accelerate the pace of completion of the International Space Station to redesign and then ultimately deploy in a full complement in the manner in which it was intended throughout the course of its development, uh, we lost the space shuttle Columbia. That tragedy and the loss of the, which was uh, not connected or related to a mission to the station, nonetheless grounded the capability for the next two and a half years. So the initial task that I was charged with of complete this program, get it moving, and accomplish the task that was set a decade mm -hmm. before for the space station, turned into redefine the nature and the focus within one year afterwards of the very objectives of what NASA was about. To bring the space shuttle back to the, to the uh, operational condition that it was, but in a safer condition, and in many ways, a, a very similar kind of challenge that Dick truly spoke to, of recovering from a, uh, an accident of that tragic proportion that required a re-examination of what we were about. And I like to think that at the conclusion of that and the President's articulation of the vision for space exploration that, again, Jim spoke to in his comments, it was a reinvigoration of why we do this. 
It is for the objective of really being on the vanguard, the leaders, in the, the, the very objectives of exploration and understanding the scope and, and requirements of what it would take in order to extend that effort beyond where we have been. And it's marked by, as it has been throughout the entirety of the 60 years of this agency's experience, of largely trying to achieve things that no one else has done or imagined could be accomplished, and then working through the challenges to accomplish each of those in turn. That has been a remarkable element of, it, of the history of this great agency, and one that I was very proud to be part of and play just that one role in the course of this chapter of the agency's history to move the ball forward. Okay, thank you. Dr. Griffin, how about you? What did you have to deal with as you worked as the NASA administrator? I'm sorry, Roger, what was the question again? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what were the key issues that you had to address as, as NASA administrator, and how did you go about accomplishing them? Well, when I came on board in uh, early 05, we had not yet returned to flight. Uh, there were technical challenges in the way, and, you know, frankly, there were cultural challenges. It was uh, during the Columbia accident investigation, it emerged that uh, many of those who felt that they had dissenting views were not able to express those. And so it became a very difficult process to try to steer the agency toward agreeing to fly the shuttle again uh, when anyone with an opinion could say why we shouldn't. Um, we were trying to fly the shuttle, uh, return it to flight. We had a two-flight return, return program. We had a space station that was one-third complete uh, and to which uh, the nation had committed its fortunes and its honor, uh, along with 14 other nations, to, to complete. And at the same time, we were being asked to design a new transportation system that would be safer going to Earth orbit and that could once again return us to the moon. Um, so that combination of things was on the plate uh, during my tenure. Uh, our flight readiness uh, review decisions were some of the most uh, difficult that decisions of which I've been a part. Um, and then we also had the difficulty that as a result of the Columbia accident, uh, Sean's former agency, the OMB, had, had managed to get itself in charge of how many flights NASA was allowed to do. And uh, I remember the first Monday after I was confirmed, I had a meeting with the OMB where um, they wanted to let me know that uh, despite uh, President Bush's commitment that we would finish the station and retire the shuttle in 2010, that I had been provided only enough money for 15 flights uh, and that the retirement would actually be in 2008. Um, when I pointed out that the president had had different <laughs> ideas in mind, uh, the budget examiner for NASA replied by saying, uh, and I quote, uh, that's as may be, but I've only given you enough money for 15 flights and to retire by 08. It took me the rest of the year to get some give uh, on, on that and to get us uh, enough flights to at least finish the space station, if not to complete the utilization program um, and, and to retire in 2010. So if you're saying, you know, Roger, what are some of the more memorable moments? W walking into all of that was something that won't soon recede from my memory. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> General Bolden, how about yourself? My, mine's pretty easy because in an organization that's known for its technical prowess and everything, and, um, and um, people thinking that the administrator is the greatest scientist, greatest engineer, the greatest whatever else there is on the planet. Uh, my biggest challenge was people. And uh, I'll go back to Mike talking about cultural things. I, um, and people not just in NASA, but people in the Congress, people in the, 
in the country and everywhere, uh, we had a mandate from, uh, from former President Bush uh, and from the nation and the Congress to phase out the shuttle by 2010, uh, complete construction of the International Space Station, and get on with commercial space flight. And uh, some of you in the audience will remember, uh, I, I didn't coin the phrase, but I, my, my biggest partners became the commercial space ideologues, who uh, said, with OMB, uh, get this NASA stuff out of the way, uh, give the money to commercial space, and let us go on to uh, bigger and better things, and commercial space will get us to the moon and Mars and everything else. And um, so I worked for a president who said, we have commitments that we have to keep. And uh, so we are going to retire the shuttle. Uh, in a hostile environment to that particular president, he got credit for the decision to retire the shuttle, a decision that had been made some many years before that. So it became difficult to go back home to Houston because I was the guy who was going to retire the space shuttle program and ruin and end human spaceflight. Um, I also had to figure out a way to work with uh, my fellow members of the executive branch and not decimate the leadership of the agency, because that was the second thing that, that they wanted to do was get rid of everybody who was there, because that was the old space. And if we were going to do what, what we wanted to do, we needed to bring in all new people. Uh, one of the things about which I am the most proud was I don't remember changing out anybody at the top of leadership for quite some time. And, um, and it was because I always felt they were among the smartest people in the room trying to help a guy who uh, would always be the one to ask the dumb question, and I really needed them and the nation needed them. So, um, and then final, finally, in terms of people, uh, convincing folk that diversity was not a bad word uh, because I thought about it, somebody mentioned diversity earlier. Diversity has become a bad word. Some organizations give scholarships and they brag about the fact that um, we're just looking for the best people. We're not thinking about diversity or any of this other stuff because it'll take care of itself. BS. Uh, it will not take care of itself and it does not take care of itself. So people were, I think that was my biggest challenge from day one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Bridenstine, this may be a little unfair since you're new to the agency, but let me just ask you the same question. What were some of the key issues as you came aboard, and how are you seeking to address them? Uh, my biggest challenge was confirmation. <laughs> I, I take it you noticed. Uh, it, was a, it, it, was, it was a challenge. We're, we're living in a very kind of uh, partisan environment, as most people here are aware. Um, a good friend of mine in the House of Representatives, Brian Babin, who is the chairman of the Space Subcommittee uh, on the Science Committee, circulated a letter advocating for me to be the NASA administrator. Um, and what was fascinating, it was a very complimentary letter, and I did not write it. He told me he was doing it, and I gave him the go-ahead, but I did not see it until later. Uh, but what was fascinating is he, he got 12, 12 Democrats to sign on to that letter. Um, but as soon as, um, as soon as, well, as soon as I got nominated, it became a kind of a partisan thing. Here's the thing, and I think this is important. NASA never has been and never should be partisan. And we've got to be very careful that it's not. And, and since I've been the administrator now for four months, um, I have found great support on both sides of the aisle for large visions that uh, ultimately um, are good for everybody on all sides of the aisle. In fact, this is also fascinating. I know we're talking about challenges. I'll talk for a second about something that's good. Mm -hmm. um, you know, after I got nominated, but before I got confirmed, the president put out his budget request, and in that budget request, he plussed up NASA by a billion dollars. And even before, you know, I got to NASA, this was back in March of this year, I was still in the House of Representatives, uh, we did a bipartisan bill, the Omnibus, and we plussed up NASA by $1.7 billion. So here I am now, the NASA administrator, advocating for a one, what I thought was going to be a $1 billion plus up for 2019, and instead it's a $700 million cut. The bottom line is this. The administration and bipartisan support in the House of Representatives and in the Senate has put us in a day where our budgets are coming back. 
And that is an amazing thing because it's been a long time since we've been in that position. I was with uh, the, the vice president the other day down at the Johnson Space Center and he gave a speech about, about space, about the future of our space exploration. And in that speech he said, we're not just matching, um, we're not just, it's not just rhetoric, we're matching the rhetoric with our budgets. And to hear the vice president say that on a stage in front of the TV cameras, um, that's, that's really good for the agency. We're very healthy and we're very bipartisan. And, and, uh, and our budgets are gonna grow. We've just gotta make sure we continue to do the right things, and it's gonna be good for, uh, for the United States of America. Okay, thank you. I have several questions that have come in from the audience, so let me take one that's gotten a lot of, uh, a lot of people's uh, little signs saying they'd like to have it addressed. Um, and we've already had a bit about this, uh, in terms of the political issues, the bureaucratic issues, the, uh, in some cases, partisan issues that are, so, that are associated with these projects. But, but the question reads, how do you make progress on projects that span multiple administrations, uh, especially with all of these other issues that are a part of the agenda of various groups, and, uh, and how do you navigate that? I, I'd throw that out to any of you gentlemen who would like to take, uh, take a whack at it. Mr. Golden. I think that if you take a look at the commercial industry, non-space, things happen in months and years. There's no reason that NASA can't do things in just years. And from my position, having been involved in a program, the space station, started by President Reagan, and still going on today, I would say no program should be more than one presidential term, and absolutely no more than two presidential terms. Second piece, how can young people learn about revolution when they're in an evolutionary state? Mm -hmm. And if you're doing a PhD in physics or biology, you want to be able to complete that during the time you're working on it. And it will change where we're going if we decide we're going to do this and really take advantage of academia. And the high-tech industry in America is moving at the speed of light. And NASA better get with the program. And otherwise, we'll never get the brilliant young people to join the program if they're going to be on 20, 30-year programs. It's got to die. Okay. Revolution is the word. All right. <laughs> Any I'll, other thoughts? Yes. I'll, I'll uh, add a few thoughts here. I, I really believe, and I, you know, um, Congress is rarely the solution to anything, um, but in this particular case, the NASA Transition Authorization Act, which was passed by Congress with bipartisan support that the president signed into law, enabled the transition from one administration to the next administration. With, with that kind of consistency and constancy of purpose that we so badly need going from one administration to the next. So I think that's important. I also think that when you look at the architectures of the future, um, it, when we bring in international partners and we bring in commercial partners, you know, I've, I've been told, um, and of course the folks on this stage know much better than me, that there was a day the International Space Station was about to be you know, canceled. And it came down to the fact that members of Congress were convinced that we ought to keep it for one reason. Because international partners started calling them and saying, we absolutely have to keep this going because of the research and the capabilities that it's gonna develop for the future. So international partners, um, commercial partners, I think are important to create that sustainable architecture of the future. Again, anything we do um, that, is, that, that builds that sustainable architecture enables constancy of purpose from one administration to the next. So international partners, commercial partners, the NASA Transition Authorization Act, I think, is a, is a, good, a good example. I had a bill in the House, um, the American Space Renaissance Act, and in that bill, I actually uh, put forth, and this was long before I ever knew I was going to be nominated for the NASA Administrator, but in that bill, I, I put forth a plan that we would have a, a panel of people um, selected in a bipartisan way from members of the House, members of the Senate, um, again, bipartisan, a panel of space experts from which the president could, so the panel of space experts would put forth options for a NASA administrator, 
and the president could pick from those options who he wanted for his or her NASA administrator. Uh, and of course, then the term for the NASA administrator would be a term of 10 years to maintain that it wasn't partisan, it wasn't political, and it would go from one administration to the next. So um, I had that in a bill called the American Space Renaissance Act. Of course, there was tons of stuff in that bill. Many in the room are familiar with it. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, there was actually talk about a, a bill like that in the Science Committee, separate from the American Space Renaissance Act, uh, that I was a co-sponsor of, and it, it never went anywhere. So um, I think there are things we can do. Congress, I think, in this case, has done some good things. OK, thank you. Uh, another question from the audience. Um, everybody has been working on this at some level, uh, and going back to Admiral Truly's time uh, with the Space Exploration Initiative, how might uh, resources uh, be developed on the moon and maybe on Mars to do things, and how did you wrestle with those issues, and what sort of efforts did you make to try to further the capabilities to, uh, to use in situ resources uh, for lunar or Mars activities? Can anybody You've got to get to the that? surface to use in situ resources. And so <laughs> the big thing is, um, is follow through on the commitment to, to give you the capability to get to the lunar surface and then to the surface of Mars. Um, you know, it, I, 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 I'm a little old, but I think we've always known that there was water on the moon at least I thought I did, and uh, we made the decision that we just weren't, weren't going to go back for a while, but we now know about uh, resources on Mars. Uh, MOXIE, which is an experiment that's going to fly um, on, on Mars 2020, will be a, an opportunity for us to, to take the first bite at the in situ resource uh, issue where we try to uh, grab CO2 out of the Martian atmosphere and dissociate it and see if we can produce oxygen the way that Jim was talking about doing on the surface of the moon. But we've got to get to the surface of the places that we want to go if we want to prove to people that in situ resource utilization really works. So um, I think we should focus a little bit less on launch vehicles and focus a lot more on things orbiting the planet from which we can uh, spring forward and then some funds on getting from whatever orbit you happen to be in, whether it's lunar orbit or Martian orbit, and get to the surface. We, you know, we can spend a lot of money on launch vehicles, uh, but we've got to start spending money on, on orbiters, orbiting platforms, and on uh, landers to get down to the surface of wherever we want to go. Okay. All right. Thank you. This is a bit of an unfair question uh, coming from the audience uh, in the way in which it's phrased. But absent the political situations that uh, existed with each of your times of leadership, uh, what fundamental changes would you have made at NASA? Anybody want to tackle that? Say that one again. Okay. Let me make sure uh, there are political leadership, there are political issues that everyone has to wrestle with. Uh, as an asset administrator, absent those concerns, uh, what would you have done to change the agency to accomplish the mission more effectively? And you, for anybody who might want to take a stab at that particular question, yes. Yeah, I think first and foremost, I mean, this is the nature of the political atmosphere that every period of our history is engaged in. Has, is always going to have an imprint on every agency, every function, everything that is public policy and orientation. So the idea that you drive this out of it, or should, I think is a misnomer because you then are denied, I think, the opportunity to recognize the scope of the public participation in that activity. That's what it is. Now, it manifests itself in all manner that are really transactional of, you know, whose district is it in and whatever else. And that's basically the nature of the job that every one of us sitting here have had to wrestle with at one time or another, sometimes more often than you wanted ever to, uh, is to sort through those particular parochial issues and challenges and the politics of it and so forth. And that is the primary job was in that respect to insulate the agency from the really extraordinary things that it does 
uh, from that kind of constant you know, iteration and, and reaction to various issues. But at the same time, translate why this matters and why the public interest is served by the nature of that public policy debate of what is a, a reasonable set of objectives, what's something we ought to view as ambitious opportunities. And in the end, it, it is about, at this agency, at NASA, a, a extraordinary manifestation of a really unique place in which we are just very much at the beginning phases of really indulging our understanding as humans that we really have a desire to explore, to know better outside of the scope of what we know today, uh, and to really develop into a wide range of different capabilities to understand this universe we live in. And in the final analysis, it is we are a very small part of a very vast place of which we've just begun to understand the rudimentary fundamentals of how, what our role is, what our place is in that broader universe expanse. That's where the politics really comes into the equation to translate this, that this is the larger objective we're talking about, not the immediacy of the parochial interest involved and keep everybody focused on that broader goal of human exploration and understanding where, why we, how we coexist within a universe that is just, we're just beginning to dimly understand. Okay, thank you. Very well said. So we have this august group of former NASA administrators and the current NASA administrator. One of the questions is, what advice would you former administrators give to Administrator Bryden Stein as we move forward? Any thoughts on that? Very dangerous. Well, <laughs> I would, uh, first of all, uh, we had very different experiences, but we all love NASA and love the space program. But, you know, in these times, I would, I would uh, invite every Democrat you know to come to lunch yeah. and understand, uh, understand the opportunity that NASA has provides and has always provided. Uh, in, in, in the final analysis, NASA's uh, a, a very unusual agency in that America doesn't have to do this. Uh, and, and therefore, the public, way beyond the people in this room, have to believe in it. And, and there's, uh, I served for Reagan and Bush and, and Clinton and Bush on various boards and stuff. And NASA is not going to succeed in this environment if, that in, if the environment is allowed to drive really tough programs. This is not an easy business. I'd like to add something. Please. As most of the discussion we've had has been about human spaceflight, a universe is much bigger than Mars. Absolutely. And that there's a very critical aspect of NASA leads the world in understanding the laws of nature, mm -hmm. to understand the origin, evolution, and destiny of everything. And sometimes in the political battles, you get so focused. I had that problem, Dick had that problem, we all had that problem. We forget about NASA is more than human spaceflight. Mm -hmm. yes. So another part of the issue that Dick brought up is 
people have different expectations for NASA. And Jim, I think if you work the other part, it's tempting to get involved in human spaceflight because it, it, it is inspirational. But I would be sure that there's a balance in the program. Yeah. And when that right balance occurs, the other part that presents opportunity is through the science program, you bring in technology that can help all aspects. So I would really try and look at that, work with it, and I think you're gonna find more support in the Congress and with the American people when you do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We only have a very few minutes left, but let me uh, ask this next question of each of you. Um, NASA's had an illustrious 60 years, and we can point to numerous examples of great successes. I would say the number one great accomplishment in NASA history uh, is obviously the moon landings. But what's number two, or three, or four, or five? That gets much harder. And it's, and, and Mr. Golden's absolutely correct, it's not just human spaceflight. There's a whole number of things. We have visited every planet in the solar system, and in some cases in sustained ways. Uh, so if you're projecting out into the future, what do you see is happening, say, maybe 60 years is too long, but we've gone, come 60 years, so let me suggest that's the way to look forward. In the next 60 years, what you might expect NASA to be able to accomplish? Um, let, let me start with Admiral Truly. Any well, thoughts? You know, Dan uh, put his finger on an important issue. NASA is much bigger than human mm -hmm. space flight, but we are humans and we love to explore. But uh, it's been 60 years of success in planetary, planetary exploration, human exploration, and aeronautics uh, and I, I I think that it's impossible to imagine 60 years from now how these will come together but they I'm convinced they will uh, okay thank you Mr. Golden, any additional thoughts? Yeah. I started my career feeling that we would be a spacefaring nation when I was an old man like this. I'd like to see America lead the world, that we become a truly spacefaring nation. We bring our astronauts back, not into the ocean. <laughs> but we have an infrastructure that works. And my ultimate vision is we need to not just explore the planets in our solar system. But I said this years ago, with the technology I see today, I'd like us to be able to image and make spectrographic measurements on planets not in our solar system. Cool. So we know we're not alone. Okay, very cool. The answer to the fundamental question, are we alone in the universe? That, that's a big, that tall order. <laughs> Mr. O'Keefe, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd say first and foremost, NASA is a, a premier technology development agency. That's its, its real sweet spot. That's what it's able to do with remarkable speed and focus when given the opportunity to do so. It becomes... Um, challenged when we start to act like an operational entity. Instead, our best achievements have always been demonstrated, again, much like I think Dan alluded to, of developing a technology, then making it as freely accessible as we have, to make it then a broader enterprise to be exploited, to accomplish the exploration agenda Far more, I mean, again, human exploration is just one dimension of it, as my colleagues have, have, have mentioned. 
And that's one aspect of it, but it is the aspect that we all relate to as people most. So in this next 60 years, I think it is going to be the quest that I think Dan just summarized well, that I can recall one space scientist always refer to as one of the quintessential objectives of why exploration is so important and what its focus is all about is he referred to it as the commitment and the quest to scrape the last crumb off the plate of human arrogance, of the belief that we're all there is in this vast human, in this vast universe. Instead, there's so much more to explore, so much more to understand of how, how we fit in that. And we are just now in the age of sale in this process of understanding that exploration objective. That's going to be the next 60 years. It'll be accelerated because, thank goodness, Bohr's law really is real. <laughs> it does accelerate the pace of how technology can be developed, applied, and employed for this larger human desire to understand. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Griffin, what do you think we'll see in the next 60 years? I don't know what we'll see. I know what I hope to see. I, I, I want to see a return of the cultural view that the key purpose of NASA is to make the United States preeminent in space. I want to see other people watching what we do on television, not us watching them. Very good. Thank you. General Bolton? I know this is a space conference and everything else, but I, I envision, um, and I'm like Mike, I can't tell you, I don't have a clue what will happen, but what I hope will happen will be that uh, the big A in NASA, aeronautics, continues to make the strides that, that it, um, you know, it has been making, particularly over the last 10 years or so, that um, uh, within the very near future, we'll have low-boom supersonic flight um, that we will revolutionize the use of, uh, of autonomous vehicles to get from place to place, that we continue to help shrink the planet uh, so that we're all able to, to communicate with people around the world much quicker, much more efficiently. And then finally, to make uh, Dr. Griffin's job easier, uh, stop screwing around with NASA and its advanced technology development like the work we did in hypersonics. Uh, and we went away from for almost a decade, right. believing that uh, NASA had no, no, no role to play in that. And, and I'm really happy to see that, you know, what Mike is doing over there in, the, in that five-sided building uh, is kind of <laughs> shaking people up in the executive department, in Congress and everywhere, uh, because we fell behind, because people forgot about what NASA's forte was in the Big A. Okay, thank you. <laughs> It, it is absolutely true that, and this goes for all of NASA's history, whatever country controls the technology controls the balance of power on Earth. Yeah. And this goes all the way back to post-World you know, War II Operation Paperclip when the United States of America <coughs> went into East Germany with the intention of gathering up the V-2 rockets and, and even some of the best German scientists, including our own you know, Werner von Braun, mm -hmm who ultimately helped us uh, get, to, get to the moon. So controlling the balance of power on Earth requires the United States of America to remain preeminent, uh, which is, has been you know, articulated here on this stage. And um, certainly I would, um, I, I would argue that if you look forward 60 years, the question is, what are those next technologies that are going to keep us at the front of the balance of power? And, you think about things like quantum communications and quantum computing. The hypersonics was mentioned, and, and certainly uh, Mike Griffin has a tremendous uh, charge there in his current role in the Pentagon. And uh, of course, great, great relationship uh, with NASA, because we have a lot of the facilities that do uh, not just the wind tunnels, but the arc jet and other facilities that are necessary for um, really amazing capabilities that the DOD has. Um, and I look forward to all that DOD money coming to help us refurbish our <laughs> yeah. capacity. Um, so look forward to that conversation, Mike. We'll have that soon, I'm sure. Um, 
But, but, uh, but NASA is critically important for the balance of power on Earth. Not because we are a defense agency, we are absolutely not. We love, quite frankly, not being a defense agency, but we are also, um, we understand that our obligation is to continue to develop that, that technology that Sean O'Keefe was talking about. Um, and that's, uh, that's a big charge that we have to keep, so thank you. All right. <laughs> Gentlemen, I would like to thank each of you for being here today. Uh, we have to leave it there. I do want to pause for just a moment and uh, thank both NASA and uh, the AIAA, especially Mike Green and Craig Day, uh, who were so instrumental in putting together this panel. Uh, we thank you all in the audience for being here. And let's give another round of applause for everybody who had a part in this.